how do you work to keep your options open? How do you, how do you, how do you, what sorts of look, things are you looking for to figure out how to try and hit that sweet spot of being able to, you know, have the big picture of where we might be going and the reality of we've got to get stuff out soon and yep. you know, into the hands of people and working. So, so I have a relatively simple mental model, and it's somewhere in my in my blog. I'm disorganized enough that I make everything I write public, so that I can use Google Search to to find it. Works pretty well. <laughs> so, so somewhere I have a I have a mental model where I where I try to bucket my uncertainty into three big buckets. The one is I can guess the answer with high enough likelihood. I just go do it. Yeah. The second one is, I don't know what the answer is going to be, but I can boil it down to sort of A, B, C, or D, right? I can make something that sort of has distinct buckets. And then there's sort of the third layer where I have no idea. And I call this there, I just minimize the cost of being wrong. And then yeah. I look at sort of what percentage of my problems roughly fall into which bucket and sort of how can I optimize these these kind of buckets right the middle bucket that is clearly well the top one is easy if you're right right yeah. the biggest danger is believing too many things in the top bucket where you thought you're right but you're not the next layer down that's the options right yeah. and to drill into how you deal with that is i come back to the uh, financial services right like when you buy an option i like really quickly like options are basically you acquire the right to buy a share of of stock in the future I right? mm -hmm. say like, I, you know, let's just stick with Allianz, right? You know, I buy an option to buy Allianz stock for 200 euros in one year. And the benefit of that is in one year, if the stock is more than 200, I can use my option. I buy it for 200. I have money in the bank. If yeah. it's less than 200, right, then I don't need to buy it, right? I let the option lapse. So I deferred my decision, right? Very important yeah. for architects. I deferred my decision, but I kept my options open, right? I yeah. lock in my $200. Now that thing has a cost, right? That option doesn't come for free. Well, yeah. there's people making billions of dollars selling, trading these options, right? So the option costs, and it costs us in IT as well. So there's a very interesting uh, metaphor here for the architects, and that is option price versus strike price and let me pick my favorite on favorite topic cloud migration right multi-cloud you know, lock yeah. that whole story right a lot of people try to make the strike price zero so let's say one day the scenario comes where i need to go from cloud a to cloud b they sort of dreaming up a scenario where like oh i just push a button and it goes from here to here right this is what i call strike price zero when i use the option it costs me nothing yeah. what happens that option has an enormous price right now, yeah. right? Because that's the most expensive option to buy right now. And if you ask anybody from the financial services, there are no options of strike price zero. Like it, yeah. it makes no sense, right? So the key thing to manage the middle layer is sort of how much am I willing to pay now versus how much am I willing to pay in the future when I actually need this option? So let's say, right? Yeah. I have maybe a 2% chance that I want to switch cloud platforms in five years, yeah. right? That costs me a million dollars, let's say, let's make it expensive, right? But if that's a million dollars, there's 2% chance, it's like 20,000, right? So your liability is like 20,000. Well, how much are you going to build for $20,000? Well, probably not all that much, right? Like, be careful about it. And how about if I try to bring this down from a million dollars to like a thousand dollars? Well, that might cost me. 200,000 right now, I'm like, oh, that's like 10x, right, for liability. So I highly encourage architects to sort of have this way of thinking, strike price versus option price, and not yeah. always believe that the options should be free. They don't have to be free. They just have to be a reasonable balance between the effort I make now and having the option later. Like, putting a common APIs between your services, right? The cost yeah. isn't super high and it buys you not a zero strike price later, right? If I go and build a new service in Golang, I probably have to put some libraries in, do some testing, right? I have some cost, but it's reasonable. So it's about finding that <coughs> kind of, kind of trade-off, right? So that's the middle layer of options. Find the balance between option price you pay now and strike price you might pay when you need to make that change. I, I wanted to I, say, I, 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 no, go ahead. 
uh, yeah, the bottom layer. And I know it's like like I'm going down my yeah. mental model period. The bottom layer, right, where I said you have no idea, you can't even define distinct options, right? How you do? How do you reduce the cost of being wrong? And I think this one is exactly down your alley. The yeah. best way of reducing the cost of being wrong is to increase your velocity. If yes. I can make a change faster, if I move more quickly, I have high levels of automation, I have continuous delivery. Being yeah. wrong is half half as horrible, right? Because like, hey, yeah. you just like you just make it right and you never look back. So the bottom layer, the tooling and approaches, right? Thanks to you and many yeah. others, right? The tooling and approaches that allow us to to deal with being wrong more easily actually allow us to push more things into the bottom layer of that pyramid without yeah. paying a huge penalty. So like, we don't know, big deal, right? We figured out, and when we figured out, it's going to take us like three days and. So be it. I don't need to buy any options for this at all. I just do it when I get there. It always sounds like a cop-out kind of architecture, but I think the exercise has got to be let that layer live. Like that layer is there for a reason, and you just deal with it when you get there. If you have high velocity, no big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that, that, that enabling, I think the thing that that enables is the ability to treat your work and your ideas as, as as more like experiments you can try try out those things yeah. and see what works and what doesn't and that gives you that ability to to navigate on certain territory more effectively but um if you need to change it no harm done right so yeah, i yeah, think yeah. in the end the biggest progress we made in the industry is that our tooling and our approaches really allow us to reduce the cost of of being wrong right i run in yes. the cloud I provisioned two VMs. Oh, yeah. I was wrong because I need 10. Oh, yes. BFD, right? I just add eight and now I'm right. right? It's just like, so, you know, they, oh, I need, I have a change in requirement. Oh, I need to make a change. I've automated tests. I redeploy, right? Like big yeah. deal. So in the end, you know, acknowledging that uncertainty and just say like, hey, I make some decisions so I don't drown in complexity. Gregor's law, I'm willing to make some decisions, but I also reduce the cost of making a wrong decision I think that is one of the most fundamental shifts or the most fundamental ways in which we made progress. But what's interesting about it, so many organizational processes and structures are designed around the old model, that it's, you know this as much as I do, that is really hard to get people into the new model because go into some sort of traditional IT organization and say, oh, we'll figure this out when we get there. They're like, oh, you're a bad person. You're also a bad architect and you're a bad software engineer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it it takes a lot. It, it, it is a fundamental change to rather than always trying to be right and being a good guesser, yeah. to just like reduce the cost of being wrong. And like you said, let's make experiments. And if it fails, then we'll just do the next one. It's a bigger yeah. shift than most people believe. But it's the I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I'd agree with that entirely. I, I, I think it's I think it's probably the biggest challenge that agile style thinking and, and working faces really is is that um it, it's such a different way of thinking about about problems and in many ways i think all of us think that you know thinking hard and really planning and really understanding the problem is the more professional way to do it that's kind of wired into our heads a little bit but i've you know i've come to dismiss that you know i, I don't think anything complicated works like that it it's nearly always more like the kind of process that we've been describing of, of navigating the problem space and finding solutions in that problem space and and being giving ourselves the freedom to be able to navigate it and that, and that to me deeply scientific idea of starting out assuming that your ideas might be wrong rather than starting out assuming that they might be right is probably one of the most profound ideas in human history in many ways but certainly it's it's one of the principles on which the whole of agile thinking to me seems to be built.